I'd like to introduce Nora Lurch. She's giving our lecture this evening on um, the caregiver's role in managing symptoms and side effects of ovarian cancer. Uh, she is one of the best nurse practitioners, in my opinion. Uh, she works with uh, all of our uh, survivors and patients and women in treatment downstairs. Um, so I'll turn the time over to her for now. Thanks, Mary. Welcome, everyone. Um, so tonight I want to talk about the role of caregivers in managing symptoms that occur with treatment with ovarian cancer. Um, I'm going to focus more on after surgery, but I'll talk a little bit on surgery too, but I'm going to talk more about side effects with chemotherapy because I think that's probably the more significant portion um, where symptoms occur. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you have a question or um, a comment. Um, just a little background for myself. Um, I've been a practitioner for 18 years, I think. Um, I worked in family practice for a long time and moved, relocated back to the Pittsburgh area. And so I joined uh, McGee Women's Health and I work with the University of Pittsburgh Physicians. Um, we do G1, we are a group of seven G1 oncologists and multiple um, advanced practitioners. Uh, and I work mostly in the office with women that are receiving chemotherapy, following them up after surgery and doing surveillance exams. So that's my role. Um, tonight I want to talk about um, ovarian cancer and statistics and treatment, just a little overview. You guys have probably already heard these before, but I just thought we kind of um, started a baseline there. Uh, I'm going to talk about surgery-related side effects, a little bit about management. I don't want to talk so much about management of those side effects, um, although what we talk about with chemotherapy, side effects and management still apply to the surgery side effects because they can be very similar. Um, Chemotherapy-related side effects and management we'll talk about next. And lastly, I want to talk about caregiver issues and burnout, um, which I think is a really important topic. These are the, some of the statistics for 2011. You can see that ovarian cancer um, has about 3% occurrences um, for the cancers in females, but unfortunately it accounts for 5% of the deaths. Um, we are actively working on that here at McGee. Um, the incident rate is about 1.4 in 100,000 women uh, that are less than 40. It's higher in women over 60. And the mean age of diagnosis is 63. And this is for epithelial cancers. Not uh, you can, There's a variety of ovarian cancers, but um, the most common is epithelial, and these statistics are for that cancer. This is a quote about living with ovarian cancer you may have seen. How does one begin to describe the one moment in your life when you hear you've got cancer? These three words changed my life forever. My moment came when I was diagnosed. I then embarked on the largest unplanned, unwanted, and most expensive journey of my life. My cancer diagnosis was a wake-up call that jolted me out of complacency and inducted me into a battle I neither wanted nor understood. And that battle takes place also with the caregivers. So I think it's very important that we understand that um, the cancer affects the um, woman's whole support system and we're not dealing with just the patient, we're dealing with their family, their friends, and how that affects their life. They're going to be coming into the office with us uh, and uh, helping the patient through their visits. And it's important that um, we're addressing their needs too. Um, some of the treatments that we use are surgery and chemotherapy. I'm not gonna fo focus on hormone therapy, that is one therapy, but it doesn't have many side effects. Um, for surgery, I, most important thing is that um, you see a certified gynecologic oncologist, and we have a group of seven here, but there's many across the country. The reason that that's so important is that it is very important that you get what's called an optimal debulking, and that means that we try to get um, all of the cancer out so that there is less than one centimeter of cancer um, visible. Um, and that relates to the patient's overall survival. Uh, women that have an optimal debulking have 39-month um, um, survival versus women that have 17-month survival rates. Uh, and this would be for stage 3 disease. Um, so gynecology oncologists are much more likely to achieve an optimal debulking, and so that's why it's important that um, you get paired up with them. Um, some of the side effects that you can have from surgery, it's a very big surgery that you undergo. So the biggest side effect is fatigue. Um, and people would think that the biggest side effect is pain. Um, but pain is very manageable and we can give you medicine, but we can't give you medicine for the fatigue. So that's a very limiting um, factor. And I think it's probably one of the harder things uh, for women to deal with, um, especially as the pain and the other um, side effects of surgery um, lessen. They want to do more, they want to get back to normal as quickly as possible, and the fatigue is probably the most limiting factor. 
Um, you can also have nausea and vomiting. That's generally only in the first few days postoperatively. Occasionally it'll be for a longer period of time. Um, we certainly have medications to control that. Um, you can have constipation. Um, many of the women that undergo surgery for ovarian cancer have significant um, bowel surgery. Um, so the surgery itself can slow the bowel. The, um, the uh, uh, anesthesia can slow the bowel, the lack of activity, sometimes the lack of fluid, um, those all can lead to constipation. So it's important that um, they have a very good bowel regime after surgery. Um, and then there's wound infections, that's always an issue. Um, the role in the caregivers postoperatively is huge. Um, the impact of shorter hospital stays, limited hospital discharge planning, and the spread of home-based medical technology is a factor in the increased role of family members um, in patients' health care, and that's according to an AARP study. They found that 23 to 53% of family uh, members have to give um, health-related tasks such as bandaging and wound care, managing catheters, giving injections. Um, that is a huge part of the caregiver's role. I just taught somebody in the office today to do a, a wound dressing change. Um, they're traveling from far away and we couldn't have home health um, be with them all the time, so I had to teach them how to pack a wound. Um, and I'm amazed on a daily basis at, at what we ask caregivers to do for their, their family members. Um, and it's an unfortunate um, side effect of um, lack of health care for some, um, lack of coverage. So um, I'm always um, amazed at what caregivers um, step up to the plate to do. Um, surgery recovery generally takes about eight weeks um, for the lifting restrictions and, and for recovery from fatigue. If you weren't going into chemotherapy at eight weeks, we'd say you're, you know, you're done. But then we um, try to start chemotherapy within four weeks of surgery, so that compounds the recovery. And I think the most important thing is that caregivers and um, patients need to ask for help during this period of time because it can be an overwhelming time. Once you've had surgery, generally you'll go into chemotherapy, and some of the first lines of chemotherapy um, are um, platinum-based um, compounds um, and taxols. Um, you may have our um, institution uses um, Avastin quite a bit. Um, that's generally added a few cycles into it because it can delay wound healing also. Those can be given by an intravenous route or an intraperitoneal route, which is in the belly. That's IV and IP. Um, intraperitoneal regimens are very big here at McGee. Um, we use them for patients that all of the cancer has been taken out. Um, and generally, they, we use cisplatin and placotaxel. Um, we feel like it has a bit more favorable outcome versus IV chemotherapy. And generally, women are going to get it three, three times in a cycle. So every 21 days is considered a cycle. They're going to come in three times. And that's quite um, a lot to ask for a woman and their caregiver. So it can be um, a quite arduous task. Um, Less than half of um, women that try intraperitoneal chemotherapy completed. I think our statistics here at um, McGee are higher than that. Um, that's because it is um, arduous. It can be painful because the belly swells from the chemotherapy. It can cause nausea, vomiting. Um, but we work very hard to get women through the courses. I would say our um, rate is more like 75 to 80 percent. Um, and even if you don't complete all six courses of chemotherapy, there is still a survival advantage over um, just IV chemotherapy. Um, so again, it's important here for caregivers to help with chemotherapy um, because there may be more side effects with intraperitoneal and they're going to play a bigger role at home. Intraver intravenous chemotherapy is generally um, weekly taxol with carboplatin every 21 days, or you can see both given every 21 days. The, there's a new regimen where um, women come in every week and get a small dose of Taxol, and then uh, once every three weeks they have carboplatinum added to that. So again, that's, that's quite difficult. Um, and living with treatment, the chemo just takes something from deep inside of me that can only be explained as part of the spirit. I've gone through the nausea stage and now am now beginning to emerge from the no energy stage. Um, and so she's talking about some of the side effects there, and they can be, they can be severe at times. Some of the side effects include fatigue, nausea and vomiting, constipation and diarrhea, hair loss, neuropathy, which is numbness or tingling in your hands or feet, um, abdominal pain, especially with intraperitoneal chemotherapy, those women are going to complain more of abdominal pain, headaches, um, you can have bone marrow suppression, which is your low white count, your low hemoglobin, um, sleep disturbances, and memory or mood changes. I'm going to focus on the ones in red um, because I don't think we need to go through all of the side effects, but those are the ones that I think I see the most of. Um, the bone marrow suppression, there's not a lot that the caregivers can do for that. That's something that we have to manage um, clinically. 
and um, hair loss, there's not a lot of treatment for that. But one of the, probably the biggest thing that we need is to have people tell us whether they're having symptoms or not. And that's probably the um, hardest thing that, uh, can be one of the hardest things for women and their caregivers. Um, they did a study that showed that 40% of women had not discussed their most bothersome uh, symptoms with their healthcare provider in the last month. Um, and 50% had never received recommendations for mo their most bothersome symptoms. And I think that's very telling. Um, and caregivers can be um, really good advocates in this role. Um, you know, a woman will say, oh, you know, I have some neuropathy, but it doesn't really bother me. And then the husband will say, well, what about the time you tripped here and then you dropped this ice cream bowl? And, you know, so um, feedback from the caregivers can be very helpful. Um, 21% of current symptoms were not reported during the last um, clinic visit, too. Um, and this sets an early, you know, early pattern of symptom management can set a, um, expectations. If a woman tells their provider um, that you know, they're having some constipation and the provider just brushes it off and doesn't give them any feedback, you know, she's going to be less likely to tell us the next time. Uh, and so again, that's where somebody as an advocate for the patient, whether it's a family friend or a um, family member, um, it's important that you get the answers you want at those first couple of visits because it really will set the stage for how your um, treatment um, course goes. Um, most women will get some of these symptoms. Rarely will they get all or none, and that's one thing that we try to stress to our patients. This it can be tolerable, and we try as hard as possible to make it tolerable. <laughs> I see some people smiling. Um, and tolerable is different for everybody. Um, I can't stress enough, it's important to tell us what's going on. Um, and coming in with a list, um, you know, the, your provider might joke, or you have a list, or you might joke, but I think it's very important because you're stressed, the provider's probably stressed, they probably have a bunch of people they need to see that day. So it's important that you get your questions answered and that you remember them. So um, don't be afraid to write things down and to tell us. And tracking what seems to make it better, make it worse is important um, information for us to help you. Symptom management. Um, one of the big things um, are women are hesitant to tell us symptoms because they're afraid if they tell us symptoms, we won't give them chemotherapy. And that's certainly not true. Um, there are many things that we can do um, to help. Um, we can adjust the, uh, the chemotherapy regimens. Sometimes it's just a small dose reduction will qu help quite a bit with symptoms. Um, sometimes it's changing the regimen slightly. Um, there's many medications that we can give to help it be more tolerable. So I really encourage women to not be afraid to discuss these um, issues with their health care provider um, because our goal is really to make this as tolerable as possible. Um, obviously our ultimate goal is we want to combat this disease and um, our goal is to get you through your chemotherapy so that you can do that, um, but we also want to make it tolerable. Uh, so it's important to work with us and with your caregivers so you can reach those goals. Some of the symptoms that I want to focus on are fatigue, uh, nausea and vomiting, peripheral neuropathy, which is the numbness and tingling in your hands and feet, and constipation, and then memory changes, chemo brain. My husband was, he said, is it really called chemo brain? I said, yeah, it's really called chemo brain. <laughs> So the biggest thing, um, the biggest side effect that I think happens with chemotherapy, many studies will show, is fatigue. Um, the causes can be the disease itself. Cancer is, is hard on your body. You're fighting a disease. There's the emotional aspects of the disease. And then there's also the chemical um, changes that happen in the body with bone marrow suppression. Um, you get anemic, you get neutropenic, and those in and of itself cause fatigue. Uh, so it's definitely multifactorial. Um, and I think the other thing that's hard with this fatigue is the world doesn't stop. Um, you still have to take your kids to school. You still have to pay your bills. You have to work. Um, and it's very hard to deal with all of those other aspects of life while you're also trying to um, focus on your cancer and you have this overwhelming fatigue that can occur. Generally, the fatigue is going to be um, progressive. So as your first chemotherapy might not be so bad, but by you get to the sixth cycle and you're saying, yeah, I've had enough. I'm, I'm done. Um, some of the management techniques, and the, some of these are just common sense. You want to take naps. You want to take breaks. You're not going to be able to be Wonder Woman while you're going through chemotherapy. Although I'm amazed at the women I see and that they're still gardening, cleaning their windows, mopping their floor. I often say, why didn't you come to my house? Because I'm not doing all that at home. 
I'm just always amazed. Um, try to continue exercise, though. You, um, the same is true when you're sick as when you're healthy. Exercise um, begets energy, so um, you probably are going to need to scale it back if you were an avid runner or um, somebody that exercised um, uh, strenuously, but definitely taking walks and being active, like gardening, those are all important to continue. You definitely want to maintain good nutrition. Um, you want to increase your protein and um, absolutely ensure adequate hydration. You want to think of it as an athlete. This is your marathon and you're trying to get through it. That's an analogy a lot of people use. And if you don't fuel your tank, you're not going to have any energy. So you definitely need to try um, to uh, maintain nutrition. Um, and you want to try to accept help. Um, when I tell women all the time, people want to help you. People often are coming up to you and saying, what can I do to help? And you need to give them concrete suggestions. You can come over on Tuesday and do a load of laundry. You can come over Thursday and cut my grass. Uh, that, you know, they're asking. They're not just saying these things to, to be nice. They want to help. And it, if, if anything, it makes them feel good about themselves, so you're doing something good for them. And the women I um, take care of seem to always be people that are helping others. So you can think of it that way. Give them concrete suggestions and have your caregivers help with delegating. You know, if there's many people that are trying to make meals, have them make up a schedule for you. If there are people that are, you know, helping to give you rides, schedules, schedule that. Um, definitely enlist um, people for help. The next symptom I'm going to talk about is nausea and vomiting. Um, some of the Chemotherapies we use are more likely to cause nausea. Some women with repeated treatment will get cisplatin, atoposide, or IFEX. Those tend to be more um, uh, nausea provoking, but any chemotherapy can cause it. And especially when we give it intraperitoneal, we use that drug called cisplatin, and that can cause um, some increased nausea and vomiting. Um, you're probably more prone to this. I thought this was an interesting slide. I, I found this on um, uh, the Mayo website. Um, if you're a woman, so that's all of us that are getting treatment for ovarian cancer. If you're younger than 50, which is a large population, if you have a high level anxiety, I think they mean prior, but everybody that's going through ovarian cancer has a high level of anxiety. If you had a history of morning sickness or motion sickness, and if you weren't a drinker. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I guess uh, out, people that drink more have a more tolerable stomach. Um, so management of nausea and vomiting. Um, there's certainly medications. Um, many of these are given prior to infusion. So you're going to be asked before your chemotherapy to take a dose of um, Decadron um, the night before and the morning of. And we're going to give you IV therapy um, just prior to the start of your infusion with something called a serotonin blocker um, to help lessen the uh, uh, nausea. This is, these medicines are going to help for that first 24 hours, and that's often what you'll see. Women will go home, they feel great for that first 24 hours, and then the second or third day, things hit them. Um, so then there's other medications that we're going to give you that will help with delayed nausea, which are Compazine, Phenergan, Zofran. There are others, but those are the main ones. Um, but some of the other management techniques is definitely smaller, more frequent meals. Um, you don't want to overfill your stomach. Um, Often women have changes in taste and smell, um, so you tend uh, to um, need to avoid certain foods if you have, it's almost like a morning sickness where you want to avoid things that tend to cause nausea for you. Um, you want to definitely increase your protein and decrease your fat. Fat definitely, high fat food um, causes more nausea for people, so you don't want to avoid the fries, the McDonald's, those kind of things. Um, and often you can't get as, met, as much volume of food in, so you want to get a big bang for your buck when you do try to eat. So that's where the increased protein comes in also um, because you, don't, you want to try to avoid muscle wasting. You want to ensure adequate hydration. I tell women often to try to use a straw, especially when you're nauseated, because you can get more sips. You want to keep something with you at all times so that um, you're constantly sipping on things. I generally tend to try to tell people to get two liters of fluid a day which can seem like a lot. Um, so caregivers, some of the things that they can do to help this is you want to encourage your, um, your loved one to take their medications, remind them the night before the day of, and also remind them when they're starting to get nauseated to take the medication. I think a lot of people think I should just buck up. I don't need to take this. I can just get through it. Um, and that's not the case. If you can stay ahead of the nausea, just like pain, if you can stay ahead of pain, you're going to get a lot more relief than if you wait till it's severe and you're throwing up. Um, 
make sure you understand the instructions. Often we give a medication that you can't take another medication for a certain amount of time. So it's important that you um, talk with your um, uh, chemotherapy nurse and understand the um, instructions. And that should be talk with your healthcare team, not take with your healthcare team. <laughs> Um, let them know if you're having nausea. This is something that we have lots of medication to help you with. We often have women come in and get IV fluids if they're nauseated. We give them IV medication. So it's not something that you have to um, struggle through. It's something that we can definitely help. Next symptom I wanted to talk about was peripheral neuropathy. And this is caused by damage to the nerves from chemotherapy. It can be progressive and permanent. Um, but for the most part, um, generally women will get better. Um, the usual culprits are the taxanes, and then also some platinum-based drugs can cause this carboplatinum, cisplatin, and oxaliplatin. And those, are, those two drugs are the main drugs that we use with ovarian cancer. So peripheral neuropathy is a big um, problem for women dealing with ovarian cancer. Symptoms, um, you get a burning, tingling pain in your hands. Some people call, say it's shock-like symptoms. Um, I have had a few patients that get an an overall neuropathy, they get a burning sensation throughout their body, but that's very much the exception, not the rule, because it generally um, happens with long nerves of the body. So it's generally hands and feet. Um, you'll notice a decreased sensation. Um, women will often complain they can't button their um, blouses, they can't do their earring and, and jewelry clips. Um, they might not be able to feel the paper when they're turning the paper or take care of money. And then uh, obviously um, decreased sensation in your feet can lead to falls and injuries to your toes. Um, you, can have weak, you can also develop weakness, um, and uh, women will have trouble actually flexing their um, ankles, almost like a drop foot. Um, peripheral neuropathy is actually one of the causes of constipation. Um, the same way it works to um, damage the um, nerves in your fingers and toes, it damages the nerves of the colon. So the peristalsis of the colon, the ability of the colon to actually push your um, stool through, is slowed. So that's one of the big reasons that women get constipation also. Um, people can become sensitive to temperatures, to hot or cold temperatures. And if you are sensitive and then you also have a decreased um, sensation, it can be a double-edged sword. Um, and it's usually worse right after you get the treatment and then by the time you come in at that third week, it's improved. But it can last for up to six months after treatment. I tell women, generally by six months, if it's not gone, then you can consider that it may be permanent. Some of the management that we have for neuropathy. Um, you definitely want to um, adjust, uh, discuss this with your provider because we can adjust your chemotherapy. If you're getting Taxol, we can reduce the dose um, or we can switch it to something it's cousin called Taxotere. So it's very important. This is probably one of the things that women are very afraid to tell us about because they're afraid we're going to stop their chemotherapy. And um, I can tell you that it's pretty rare in our office for us to stop it from the neuropathy unless you're getting very debilitated by it. Um, we're going to try to deal with the symptoms and continue the chemotherapy. So don't be afraid to talk to us about it. Um, some people will suggest supplements, vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. You need to check with your provider for the doses. Um, you can get an overdose of these uh, medications, so it's important that you're not taking too much of it. Um, there's not any significant studies that show that these help, um, but um, people still prescribe them. Um, and then there's medications. All of the medications that we use to treat um, diabetic-induced neuropathy, um, we use in um, drug-induced neuropathy, although the studies are not real good on any of them. <laughs> we haven't really found anything that's, you know, uh, more um, uh, improves things very much. Um, we can use tricyclic antidepressants. At low doses, those medications help pain. They also help sleep. Um, and, you know, I tell women often, we're not giving you this for depression. We're giving it to you for pain. You can use Neurotin, which is gabapentin. Um, this is a medication for seizures. Um, we're not sure how these medications work. We know that there is changes that are go, go on in the brain, and we're um, changing pathways there. Um, Neurotin can have a limiting effect because it can make you tired. It can make you dizzy. Um, it can, it's generally considered a three-time-a-day drug, so that can be hard. Cymbalta is a medication that's out. Um, one of the limiting factors with Cymbalta and also Lyrica um, is that uh, they're expensive and they're generally not covered for this indication. Um, so they can be hard to get. Um, some of the other management techniques. Um, I've had quite a bit of success with patients using acupuncture to help with their neuropathy. Um, there are some studies that show this is helpful. Um, unfortunately, acupuncture only works if you do it. 
So if you stop it during your acute symptoms, um, it may not uh, it may not have a lasting effect. So that can be limiting because generally it's not covered by insurance. Um, you can use massage technique and also physical therapy, especially if women are getting into weakness or balance issues. We definitely want to get physical therapy involved to try to maximize things. Um, other tips are definitely that you want to wear good shoes. This isn't the time for high heels or flip-flops. You want to have good shoes on. You want to be aware of temperatures, um, just like with children, and you set your, th um, your uh, water temperature to less than 120 degrees. I tell women to do that. Um, you also want to be cognizant of any cuts or abrasions. Um, every night before you go to bed, you should look at the bottom of your feet and your hands just to check that there are no sores that are starting that you may not feel. When you have decreased sensation and then you have a cut, it can be very easy for you to get um, an infection and not know it. Um, it's also very important if you do do gardening, you're wearing gloves because if you do have abrasions or cuts on your hands and you're neutropenic, um, you can get infections. Um, and then use handrails. Also avoid throw rugs. Those are prime places for um, tripping. And don't be afraid if it's bad to use assistive devices. I see so many women that are so hesitant to use a cane, but it can really help to um, limit the falls. And I've had two women this week that have come in with their face black and blue from falls. So it's, yeah, it's really, you know, it's hard. So be, you know, be careful. We don't want you to um, not be able to get your treatment because we have to treat you for a broken hip or, um, uh, some other fracture. The next thing I want to talk about is constipation. It's multifactorial. Um, you can have nerve damage to the colon from chemotherapy, like I talked about, from the peripheral neuropathy. Um, it can be a side effect from surgery. The, uh, many of the medications that we give for nausea are constipating. You tend to lower your fluid intake. That's why I put the two liter. I make that a goal. Most people don't get it, but if, if they do, it helps. And then also change in diet. A lot of times you're not getting as much fiber as you need. You can't get fruits and uh, um, veg fresh fruits and vegetables if you're neutropenic. Uh, and so that can lead to constipation. And then inactivity. You're generally not as active as you were um, before uh, your treatment. So some of the management techniques, you want to do lots of fluids. If your mouth is dry, you're dehydrated. So. <laughs> Um, you want to try and stay ahead of that. Use a straw. Um, you want to increase your fiber in your diet. You want to get whole wheat, fruits and vegetables. Um, they can still be canned, you know, frozen if they're, um, if you're neutropenic beans. Um, you can also take a fiber supplement, but I tell women to talk with their doctor about that, um, but that can also be helpful. And you want to definitely try to maintain your activity if you can. You also want to talk with your healthcare team. It's very important that you're on a bowel regimen. So um, generally, I tell women that they're going to take two or three medications to keep their bowels going while they're on um, therapy. So it's important that you find the right mix. There is no one bowel regimen that's better than another. Um, they're very um, provider and um, patient um, focused. So you know, talk with your provider and find what works. One of the things. Um, just so you know, uh, Senecot and Smooth Move Keys are the same, so you don't want to take those together if you can avoid it because you're getting a lot of Senna. But you can, and you won't, probably won't hurt yourself, but it's kind of the same thing. Um, and, you know, don't be afraid that you're going to be, <laughs> you're smiling, don't be afraid that you're going to be addicted to these. Um, you know, often um, people have some chronic bowel changes after treatment with surgery and chemotherapy. So these may be something that you're on, but you're not going to need more and more of them as time goes by. That's an addiction. Um, it's just something that has changed in your body, and you may need this to keep things regular. Next thing I want to talk about is chemo brain, um, which is uh, memory changes that occur during chemotherapy. We don't know the exact cause. Um, it's probably multifactorial again. Um, the cancer itself obviously causes some stress and can... Um, interfere with your thought process. Medications that we give um, definitely can cause a problem. Um, low blood counts, you know, if you're anemic, your thought process is foggy, you're not feeling good. When you're fatigued, that can interfere with um, your memory. Hormonal changes, for many of these women, we wipe out their estrogen, um, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> and that's very hard on your um, memory. And then obviously all the stress that um, these women are under. Um, from the American Cancer Society, one of the things they looked at was um, they were looking at studies on the brain, and it showed that um, areas that were involved in memory um, planning and thought process are smaller in chemotherapy. So there's actually physical evidence that you're not losing your mind, that really these changes do occur. Um, women often say, I think I'm going crazy because I can't remember anything. Um, and that's not the case. There are actual physical changes that are occurring. Um, 
But interestingly, um, the cancer itself, um, we think, is, is, plays a role because they did do images of, brain that, uh, images of women's brains that were treated for breast cancer with chemotherapy um, compared to those that were not treated with chemotherapy. These changes um, were more in the women that treated with chemotherapy, and they did persist for up to 10 years after stopping. I thought that was a long time. Um, uh, but it may not all be related to medication. Um, one of the studies showed that women uh, with breast cancer that had surgery alone still had um, world's word skill problems, and uh, seven had uh, one in seven had memory issues. So even if you were just having the surgery alone for your cancer, cancer and surgery cause memory changes too, not just the chemotherapy. So we dump that all on you. Um, other factors are fatigue, infection, nutritional def um, deficiencies, and depression and anxiety. Some of the symptoms, you'll have difficulty concentrating, um, can't remember things, forget where you put your keys, forget where you put your medicine, forget how much medicine you're supposed to take, forget when we told you to come in. Um, so you definitely have to write all those things down. Um, I forget those things just like coming to here. I came to the wrong place. So <laughs> I can't imagine if I was taking chemotherapy too. I would probably be spinning in circles. Um, word searching, a lot of word searching. People can't find words. Um, it's on the tip of their tongue and they can't get it. They have a short attention span um, and they take longer to complete tasks. Um, some of the ways you want to help your um, loved one with this, you want to encourage them to talk to us. Um, it's important that um, we know about this and um, there are things that we can suggest to help and also definitely um, we want to make sure that that's all it is. Um, we want to make sure that you're not anemic, that you don't have an infection. Um, the worst is we want to make sure that you don't have metastasis to your brain. That's a very unlikely thing that happens with ovarian cancer, but it can, so it's something that we want to keep on our radar. Um, we want to make sure it's not a side effect from the medication. You know, we give those things that we talked about before, um, uh, Neurontin or Elevil, those can um, change your memory. Um, so it's important that you talk to us. And also um, depression. Um, you know, if you're developing depression, that can actually um, cause symptoms that appear to be chemo brain, and it's important that we try to tease that out. Um, there isn't one specific test. Um, I can't give somebody a, a test in the office and that'll say, yes, this is chemo brain. So it's important that you talk with us, that we try to figure out that it's not another medical cause, and, um, and then work with you to help um, treat what's going on. Some of the strategies. You definitely want to keep lists. You want to try to stay organized, okay? That's probably the most important thing. You want to get a rest and good nutrition. Um, if the fuel tank's empty, you're not going to think straight. So you definitely, this isn't the time to try to, you know, go with four hours of sleep and get everything done. Um, it's important that you take breaks. Um, so take breaks. And then um, one of the things I do tell women to do, especially once they get past um, treatment, the treatment stage, and if they're still having the side effects, is to start to do repetitive memory exercises or games. Um, this is a recommendation for people that have dementia and Alzheimer's also. Um, we think it's helping the brain to take new pathways um, and use those, and it takes multiple times in the brain uh, using those pathways before the brain starts to do it on its own. So you want to do um, exercises or games that are not... Um, uh, are not, um, your brain is not used to. So if you always do the crossword puzzle, that's great, you can keep doing it, but you still need to add something else like a Sudoku or something else um, because your brain's used to, at, to that exercise. It's already taking that pathway. You want it to try to form new pathways. So this is an important thing that you can actively do because you, know, you feel like you know, you're going crazy at some times and if you can do these things, you're actively trying to make things better. Um, you want to limit distractions when you're doing tasks. Um, you know, similar to ADHD, you, you definitely want, it's, it's very similar um, symptoms, uh, different cause. You want to try to limit your distractions. This is the time to have the TV on, texting, and, you know, doing your computer stuff all at the same time, one thing at a time. Um, and try to accept help. I can't stress enough that um, you want to help, um, you want to accept people's help so that you can lower your stress. Next thing I wanted to talk about was caregiver burnout. I think this is an important thing. I don't think it's something that we address in the office enough. Um, caregiver burnout is emotional, physical, and or mental exhaustion. And it happens for a lot of um, our um, patients, loved ones that are helping. Um, it's caused by prolonged stress. 
Um, the average treatment for ovarian cancer is six months, so that's a long time to be helping someone, and uh, it can be very stressful for people. You might be more prone to it if you have a demanding or stressful job, um, if you are lacking sleep, if you don't have, if the caregiver um, doesn't have other supportive relationships. And that's really common for our patients. They may, they, uh, a lot of times we have couples that have been married for you know, 40 to 60 years and they depend on each other. And so they don't uh, sometimes have a lot of outside relationships or if, especially if they're elderly, um, they may have lost a lot of their close friends um, and so they're going to be more at risk for burnout. Um, and if you're certain personality traits, if you're a type A personality, you're gonna control things um, or you tend to be pessimistic or a perfectionist, you're gonna, be, you're gonna tend to um, be more prone to this because one of the first things that cancer teaches you is that you can't control things. Um, but sometimes uh, it takes a while to catch on to that and in the meantime, you can get some burnout while you're dealing with those issues. Some of the symptoms, um, 40 to 70% of caregivers have um, clinically significant symptoms of depression. Um, I thought this was interesting. You have 25 to 50% of them meet the diagnostic criteria for a major depressive disorder. And when you have caregiver burnout, you also have chronic health problems. You can have high blood pressure, poor immune function, and uh, chronic fatigue. Um, so it's important that caregivers talk with their providers. Um, and um, get help in managing these symptoms, and it's important that we try to figure out is this an actual depression or is this just that you're a little, you're overwhelmed and we just need to take a couple steps back and um, help you figure out how to deal with these things. Some of the symptoms, the physical symptoms, you can get fatigue, headaches, body aches, change in appetite or sleep, very much like the Cymbalta commercial you hear where they say, you know, depression hurts. Um, caregiver burnout hurts. You, you just get run down and um, your body starts to tell you, it starts to knock at you and say, look, you need to pay attention. I always think of these kind of symptoms as your body saying, pay attention, you're not uh, taking care of me. You get emotional symptoms. You feel like you are failing. Um, if your loved one is going through this cancer and they're dealing with it, why can't I deal with it? Why can't I take care of everything? You feel like um, you're failing and you're self-doubting yourself. You can also start to feel detached. It just feels overwhelming to, feel, uh, to deal with the emotional aspect of cancer. And so uh, because you're burned out, you start to detach yourself and you can th start to have negative thoughts. And that's hard if, if you have those issues and your loved one um, you know, you're trying to care for her and you're having negative thoughts, it's hard for them. Um, and behavioral signs, you might start to withdraw, you might isolate yourself. Um, definitely you can become short-tempered, I think that's probably the more common thing you see. And you also start to put things off because you're so overwhelmed, you just, one more thing is something that you can't deal with. So you put things off and um, you tend to procrastinate. Some of the management techniques you wanna do, you wanna to try to do good health habits. This is not the time for you to be skimpy on your health habits. And I see this so many times that husbands especially tend to not take care of themselves. And I liken this to put the oxygen mask on yourself first. If you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of someone else. You definitely need to try to set boundaries. This is not the time to have the, you know, d the dinner parties and, you know, maybe Christmas, you know, you always had, you know, everybody over to your house for Christmas Eve. Maybe this is the time to let Aunt Sally do the Christmas party because it's just one more thing and it's overwhelming. And where you want to keep that sense of normalcy, you have to be careful to um, get uh, some balance between normalcy and overdoing it. Um, you wanna lower your expectations. You're not going to be able to do um, all the things that you did before, so you have to prioritize. You need to ask for help and you need to try relaxation techniques. Um, and that's one of the things you can talk to with your healthcare provider about. I mean, there's many techniques that you can do to help um, with stress. There's also caregiver support. You wanna continue um, regular checkups with your provider. You wanna ask for help. And this is a website that I found was very good, www.caregiver.org slash caregiving. They have a lot of ideas for caregiver support. And I think, you know, we focus so much on the patient, um, but we don't often give um, helpful ideas to the caregivers. So this is one thing that we tend to, we try to recommend for them. And some support and help overall, um, I wanna encourage you to discuss your concerns with your loved one and um, discuss your concerns with, our, um, with your provider. You wanna try to educate yourself just like you're doing here. The NOCC has great um, 
material, Gilda's Club is a great um, site. And then McGee Women's Hospital has several um, videos that you can watch that um, talk about going through chemotherapy, what that's like, what's, what it's like going with uh, going through surgery, dealing with the after effects of all this, they have really good resources. I think that's it. How can you become involved? I always put this plug in. You want to talk about ovarian cancer. You want to be an advocate for women's health. And you want to join the NOCC, which is 1-888-OVARIAN or www.ovarian.org. And the one for Pittsburgh is right there. And that's it. You have any questions? Um, well, I tend to see you have to um, watch if they were somebody that was coming in and asking lots of questions and being very engaging, um, and then they tend to not be doing that. They're just sitting there. They're not asking questions. They're not um, engaging the patient. That can be a big sign. Or often you'll see the patient and the family member actually squabble in the office. So, you know, if they start to, you know, they're kind of yelling at each other and having an issue, that can be a problem. Um, and you try to look and see how they're looking. You try to ask, you know, how are you doing with this? It's important as a provider that we are asking the caregiver. So especially if they're looking tired, if they aren't as well groomed as they normally would be, those kind of things, then we need to try to um, ask them if they're having any issues too. And they often don't want to talk about it. Again, they, they feel um, guilty that they're having an issue um, and they don't want to reveal this in front of the patient. So a lot of times I'll try to get them in the hallway or, you know, when the patient's going to the bathroom and say, look, you know, you seem like you're having some problems. Is there anything I can do to help? Do you have, you know, have you talked to your doctor lately? Those kind of things. Um, you know, if I was really concerned, I'd always, I would call them at home too. I think you want to try to encourage them, you know, out of the office, gently kind of, um, point out to them why what the issue is is a concern for you like take neuropathy you know you're you're obviously falling I'm concerned you know you're going to injure something but try not to be accusatory um, uh, we've had um, patients family members call us on behalf of the patient and say look she doesn't want me to bring this up in the office but she's very much struggling with nausea and vomiting and you know if you could address in the this in the office when they come in. Um, that takes some burden off of you because you're not the bad guy that's ratting them out and telling on them. Um, but, you know, we have a little bit of insight and we can say, you know, it looks like you're a little dehydrated, you know, or, or you know, we have ways to kind of clue into those things. So um, I'd say those are the suggestions. It's hard because you don't want to push too much. You want to be supportive. Um, but also, especially if you think it's something that's might, might be dangerous for them, like they're getting dehydrated because they're nauseated or they're losing weight, they're not eating. I think it's important to bring it to the healthcare team's attention. Um, you know, we can keep your, confidential, your confidentiality but still um, advocate for the patient. Well, I think um, it's important to um, point out to the, their lo the loved ones that you know, if they're not taking care of themselves, they're not gonna be any help to their caregiver. And you know, if the roles were reversed, they would want their loved one to take care of themselves. So you have to kind of flip it back on them and say, you know, I think it's, it's important that you take care of yourself because Ellen would want you to be doing this. And um, it's causing her to feel badly if you're not well. So, you know, you're doing, you can put it back to them as it's one more thing that they're doing for their loved one um, to take care of themselves. So I think that's important. And it's important to... Um, try to enlist help from other family members. You know, if they're feeling guilty and they're um, about taking care of themselves, if other family members can help to ease the burden a little bit, then I think that they're, um, that helps so that they're able to have time to take care of themselves. You know, if they have doctor's appointments, um, but they're not going to them because they're taking their wife in for their appointment, it's a, you know, if other family members can, uh, or friends can help up, uh, step up to the plate.